Ambassador, nice to see you. Thank you. Ambassador, I want to first talk about North Korea. The news is that North Korea, DPRK, and South Korea are going to walk together at the Olympics under that one flag. Your thoughts about that? I think it's good that North Korea and South Korea are talking, um, but we shouldn't be misled by the fact that just because they've had talks about the Olympics and this is going to happen, that that's going to take away the dangerous side of North Korea until they actually stop the ballistic missile testing until they actually show that they are willing to denuclearize. We have to be very careful. They've done these talks before. That's what stalled it for all these years. We have to make sure that they're about action and that that action is to completely stop all the nuclear activity that they're doing. Well, apparently it's even going a little further that there's going to be a hockey team uh, jointly between uh, North Korea and South Korea. I, I think that's fine. I think if, if they want to do that, that's fine. But it doesn't stop the international pressure from everyone that is telling North Korea to stop. So, you know, they can go and have those regional cooperation on that level. But at the end of the day, we still have nuclear missiles in North Korea that they continue to test and they continue to threaten the United States and the world with. And so we're going to keep that at the forefront. Do you think that this is sort of a divide and conquer and this is sort of uh, some motive behind Kim Jong-un that it's not just that he has an interest in the Olympics and sort of unification of the peninsula, that there is some sort of message to the U.S.? I think this is a distraction. I think this is doing what North Korea has always done, which which is when things get hot, start talking. But the problem is we're not going to play the same game we've always played. We're not going to just talk and think that they've suddenly seen, the, you know, seen their ways and, and seen the way out. They have to tell us they're going to stop with the testing. We have to see that the testing actually stops, and then we have to know that they're going to eliminate the program. Or else. I mean, if, if they don't. I mean, we've had agreements before with North Korea right. that they have cheated on. Um, we've got a situation where they, you know, they've managed to sort of navigate around sanctions. They've had some countries that have penetrated sanctions. Um, what, what is the or else? I mean, if they, you know, and, and, and I've, I, heard, uh, I heard President Obama say we're not going to let uh, North Korea become a nuclear nation. I've heard uh, uh, people in the, the current president's administration say that they are a nuclear nation. They've got a nuclear weapon. They just haven't figured out how to deliver it. So where are we on but this? But we're not comfortable with them being a nuclear nation, and we never will. So because we we've do? seen the reckless. So what are we doing? Look, just because North and South Korea are holding hands today doesn't mean that that threat has gone away. The United States and the international community is going to keep up the pressure on North Korea to totally disband. Until that time, we're going to wait and make sure there's no activity, no testing. But when that time comes, we will decide at that point. But all the cards are actually in North Korea's hands on how we respond. So if they do the right thing, we're happy to work with them. If they don't, we've got options on the table. It is interesting, I think for the first time, correct me if I'm wrong, you were actually able, or the United States, and I, you're the ambassador um, to the UN here, to get China and Russia to go with uh, sanctions on North Korea. How did that come about? You know, we've done three resolutions now, and I think it was the largest sanctions bill that had um, ever been on a country and I think that what we had to do was show the threat and show that the threat was real and then also show that the fact that North Korea would not be doing this ballistic missile testing if they didn't have the money to do it. They're not using revenue to feed their people. They're using the revenue to build the weapons to do these tests and so what we said was we've got to cut off the revenue stream and so now you see 90 percent of the trade's been cut off over a third of the oil's been cut off multiple trade issues um, have stopped investments have stopped but it's all about making sure they don't have enough money to continue the nuclear program so you think kim jong-un is just going to say okay uh, we don't have any money so we're going to stop we don't know what he's going to do but we're, we can't be okay with just saying you know he's never going to go there I mean, this is a real threat to the United States, so we have to take it seriously. We have to keep the pressure on. There's no relaxing from the United States standpoint. What about the false alarm? We've had uh, we had the one in Hawaii just recently, and now Japan. And um, you know, what, what what's the United States going to? You know, what are we going to do to combat that? We can't keep sending false alarms out to people. I think it's terrifying. I mean, it's absolutely terrifying for the people on the ground that get those. But I also think that the administration is going to do everything they can to make sure all of that is, is in place and working properly. And those are the things that we have to continue to check up on and continue to make sure they don't happen. You recently went to Pakistan, I mean to Afghanistan, um, just got back. Why did you go there? Well, I wanted to see what the, how the U.S. strategy was working, and I will tell you it is working extremely well. How do you me what is the strategy and how do you measure the success of it? So I think you look at, first of all, the whole Security Council went, which is great because they could see the U.S. engagement in Afghanistan. And what the U.S. was looking to do was to make sure that Afghanistan never is the source of terrorism going forward. And so we have to stop the terrorism. There are a few things. We've already told them that this has to be Afghan-led and Afghan-owned. 
and that the United States is going to support the process, but they have to have the responsibility to do it, and they have. We're seeing reforms already on the corruption. Um, they have set in retirement in place, moving the age from 72 to 60, which basically did away with 4,000 military leaders, including 70 generals. So now there's a younger generation coming into the military. We see girls are now going to school, which wasn't happening. The status on women is changing. It's got a long way to go, but it is changing. And they're really owning up to the responsibility that they have. And so, um, and what we've seen more than anything is the Taliban is greatly weakened and wow. has, has recessed and is close to coming to the table. And that's exactly what we want. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of the things that the Afghan, the problem in Afghanistan is, is getting terrorist help from Pakistan. Am I correct? Well, what, that's a threat. I that's mean, a, no, it's a, real th it's a real threat and a real problem. And that as a consequence is that we're cutting off aid. The United States President Trump has had very harsh tweet after the first of the year, and you've had harsh words about Pakistan saying you know, we're, we're cutting our aid to you. Well, I think what you saw is that through all of our meetings in Afghanistan, there was one thing that continued to ring true through the, all of the meetings. And that is that every time Afghan starts to move in the right direction, Pakistan sets them back because of the, the ability that they continue to harbor terrorists in Pakistan. From our standpoint, the only way we're gonna have a safe and stable Afghanistan is if we eliminate that threat. We have told Pakistan, we tried to work with them, they didn't wanna do it, we're just letting them know we mean business. We're not gonna turn around and give a billion dollars in military aid for them to harbor terrorists that shoot at our soldiers. We're just not gonna do that. And so cutting off that military aid was sending them a message. I hope it brings them to the table and, real, and they realize that they have to stop this. It's not just about Afghanistan, it's not just about the region, it's about the world. And we made a strong point in doing that. I don't pretend to have all the solutions, but what we're cut off the aid to Pakistan, quite naturally the first thing we worry about is whether or not we create a vacuum. I know that China has already built a military, or they're working on a military base in, in um, Pakistan, and we've got a, we've got a situation um, in Pakistan where historically AQ Khan was the one who gave the technology to North Korea for the nuclear weapon. So naturally if we alienate, not that Pakistan has been a good friend to us, but to the extent that we withhold money, do we run the risk of creating uh, more of an incentive for Pakistan to work with North Korea, and does China move in and have greater influence in Pakistan when we're hoping they're gonna help us in North Korea? You know, I know a lot of people have scare tactics and thoughts about, oh, but this will happen or that will happen. What I know is what has already happened, which is everyone has tiptoed around Pakistan for years, and Pakistan has continued to harbor terrorism. Now we're doing things differently. We are not gonna reward bad behavior anymore. And so this is telling Pakistan, no more acting like you're doing the right thing and hurting what we're trying to do. If you wanna be with us, we want you to be with us. But if you're gonna to continue to work against us, we're not gonna pay you to do it. All right, on the whole idea of, of money, American money and contributions, UNRWA has had, uh, you, you've been very vocal in reducing the amount of contribution the United States makes, and this has to do with what goes on in, in, in much of the, the refugee camps in the Palestinian part of the world. Um, what's, what's the end point on this? Well, I think there's a couple of things. We have mentioned to UNRWA and have said multiple times it needs to be reformed. Let me just stop you here. Reform meaning that, because uh, I know that Israel is unhappy with it, thinking that it's, you know, it's anti-Israeli and that it's a, it's a fertile uh, ground, a breeding ground for terrorism against Israel. Is the reform that way or is the reform in sort of the bureaucracy and how it's run and how it distributes the money, to, uh, to the, the aid to the uh, camps. I think we're looking at overall reform and when we say that we're basically looking at the fact that you've got uh, basically they're considering any Palestinian is a refugee. You're looking at the fact that what they're teaching in schools is not necessarily the right way to have things run. It is very top heavy from an administration standpoint but also the other side of that is again we're not going to reward bad behavior. Here you've got the Palestinians who are basically saying they're gonna cut the U.S. out of the peace process. They're saying that they no longer wanna have anything to do with us. They go and take us to the United Nations and try and, um, you know, basically are very hostile in what they say and what they do. We're not gonna pay to be abused. It doesn't make sense. What we're gonna say is, look, we wanna help you. But first of all, you've got to show us that you're going to reform something that's broken. Secondly, don't think that you can sit there and say hateful things about us and us turn around and write you a check. It's wrong in every term. And so basically what we're saying is, look, you can have this little bit, but after that, we're going to reevaluate the relationship. All right, again, I don't mean to make this seem like simple that I have all the answers, but the problem is that when you do that, 
You're also withholding money from refugee camps in nations like Jordan, which is already very uh, financially pinched by having so many refugees in their country. So we hurt one of our allies, and they've got enormous problems every time you know they don't get the money from us to help. So you know it, it punishes not just the people who don't run UNRWA the way the, you know, we'd lo the United States would like it, but people, nations like uh, Jordan. Greta, why does the United States have to be the only one that bails out everyone? Because why do we continue I, to give the money? You have 120 countries who voted against us that could more than take up the, the um, level of debt that UNRWA has. Why is it the United States? We need to start being smart about the way we spend. We need to start really looking at foreign policy and seeing what the U.S. goals are and where we want to go. We want a peace process between the Israelis and the Palestinians. We want to make sure that moves forward. By the Palestinians cutting us out of the peace process, it shows that they weren't serious, that they're not serious in truly getting to peace. So we're trying to make sure that if we're going to spend taxpayer dollars, that we're not spending it on something that doesn't move U.S. interests forward. I guess that my thought is, is only this is that Jordan's been an ally and do we run the risk of creating that vacuum and, and like as I said I don't have the answers but do we, do we when we make some of these decisions and even though you know I, I don't like to spend a dollar to be insulted I don't you know I, I want to see every dollar spent you know well um, in, in my personal businesses um, but do we run the risk that uh, we hurt a nation who's been our ally and been so important even in, in that region to us by, by do, making decisions like this. But that's assuming that UNRWA is all we do. We actually, I not only went to Jordan, I also went to Turkey. We met with their governments. We brought them back and met with the Secretary General in the UN to see how we shift money to better help those host countries because they're doing an amazing job with Syrian refugees. So we do a lot. UNRWA is one part of it. But we fund a lot of different things. We recently worked with Jordan on how we could better help them with infrastructure. We turned around and worked with Turkey because they wanted help with education. Those things are going to continue to happen. We're not holding that back. But what we are going to say is we're not going to blanket write a check to all of them. We're going to start to prioritize where and who they need money. We have a great relationship with Jordan. That's not going to change. We're going to continue to fund them. We're going to continue to assist them where they need it. It's just not going to be through UNRWA. All right, Iran, uh, naturally the whole, in, in that's in the top of all the agenda is the whole the, the deal that the United States and other nations struck with Iran over the nuclear weapons program. Where do you stand on that? It was a bad deal. It was a dangerous deal. We basically gave them billions of dollars to turn around and say they weren't going to do nuclear, but allow them to do everything else, from ballistic missile testing to support on terrorism um, to you know continuing to move arms. It's it's incredibly dangerous. If, if I take that premise, it's a bad deal, and I, and I have not read the whole deal. And I, uh, but if if the United States backs away from the deal, this was a deal that you know our, that our government, that our government made, our former president made. Uh, what does that tell another nation? Let's jump ahead. Let's say Kim Jong Un that we want to sit down with him. We want to strike some deal with him. Why would he trust our word if all of a sudden the next president comes along and says, "Well, that was a dumb deal"? Because we, if you don't hold true to what your responsibility is, we don't hold true to ours. Now is not we'll give you the money and we hope you act okay. Now is look if we're going to be part of this deal, you have to keep up your end of the bargain. And and not only that, when you look at Iran. You have to also look at the fact in what country, in what part of the world is it okay to send ballistic missiles and use them like, they're, about do Yemen? like they're doing with the Houthis in Yemen? In what way is it okay for them to support terrorism, which they continue to do around the region? In what way is it okay that they continue to support Assad in the way that he has abused his people? I mean, in what way is all of that okay? That is not part of the deal. We're in compliance with the deal, but what we're saying is, look, we're doing everything with the deal we're supposed to, but all of these other actions, the EU needs to step up, we need to see the international community step up, and Iran needs to step up, and those things need to stop, and that's what you're seeing the U.S. say, if you want us to take your deal seriously, then you have to take all these other actions seriously. So correct me if I'm wrong, saying is that, is that um, the deal itself is that we're complying 100%, that they are complying with the words of the agreement. However, on the side, they're doing these other things that aren't in the agreement, like they supplying are. weapons of, to the Houthis. Is that, is, that, is that a violation of the deal itself, or is that just other bad behavior? That is violations of multiple Security Council mm -hmm. resolutions. But not Those the deal. Are, is that part of the Iran deal? It's not part of the Iran deal, which is why we're in it. But it is, it is absolutely violations of multiple UN resolutions. And we recently had a report that just came out that cited those violations. So that's not us. 
That's actually the United Nations came out and cited Iran for ballistic missile testing, arms sales, um, support of terrorism, all of those things. So, so we're not just being one actor that's saying this. We're now showing the international community we still have things that are dangerous and it's not safe and we have to do something about it. Uh, you also traveled to uh, South Sudan, been to a refugee camp there, um, met with uh, President Selva Kiir. They are in the midst of a wicked civil war. Um, we're, you know, what's, is, what's our, uh, when I say our, I say United States, what's the UN doing about this? What's the U.S. doing about it? What do you see as our role in that? Well, we basically went to South Sudan to see exactly what was happening on the ground and to find out what the situation was. And I had a frank conversation with President Kier. And I said, look, the U.S. supported you, counted on you, put a lot of investment in you, and we're not getting a return on investment. And this he said is, what? What did he say? I mean, he listened. And then we said, this is what has to happen. The fighting has to stop. We have to make sure that our humanitarians are getting access, and we need to see a change in your government. And his response was, you will start to see a change. So he has now issued a memo that, uh, that encourages all local governors to accept humanitarian actors throughout the country. We're waiting to see if that follows through like it's supposed to. He had held off on fighting, but we're starting to see that come back again. These are things that we're gonna have to continue to keep the pressure on. I went to multiple refugee camps. And the way the South Sudanese live, no one should live like that. It is a terrible situation that is being done by a, you know, a hostile political actor that needs to be reined in. And the U.S. doesn't need to support that anymore. So he has the scenario basically where I said the decision was up to him. If he decided to continue to fix things and try and make life better for the people in South Sudan, we'd continue to support him. If he's not, we're going to completely reevaluate our situation with South Sudan. 2012, President Obama lifted the sanctions in Myanmar in part on the military, military in Myanmar. Um, and, and the hope was is that that would advance them towards democracy. And, and in fact, they elected Aung San Suu Kyi to be their president. Uh, we're now in a situation, at least since August, where almost a million people have been chased by the Myanmar military out of, out of Myanmar into Bangladesh. Um, I've been to the refugee camp. I heard stories of women told me that babies were ripped out of their arms. Um, the, I've seen in, uh, horrible stab wounds on children. This is a, an absolutely horrible humanitarian catastrophe. And all these people are now in Bangladesh in this refugee camp. What, what, if anything, is going to be done by the UN or the United States to combat this humanitarian crisis? It is one of the worst tragedies I think I've ever seen. I mean, to see exactly the full scope of the ethnic cleansing that has happened in Burma is terrible. And you look at the fact that they were driven out by the military, they were treated horribly, whether it was throwing babies in fires, raping women, um, killing families, all of those things, to now have those refugees in Bangladesh that doesn't have much to start with. So what, what can be done? Well, I think a couple of things. We have um, obviously worked with the Secretary General at the United Nations. I think he is looking to put a special envoy that goes actually to Bangladesh and Burma to look at the situation. We've put harsh um, pressure on the military, although I don't know that they're, we're seeing the changes that we want to see. They've got two Reuters uh, journalists who are trying to report on what's going on in the Rakhine um, area of Myanmar. They've got them in custody. They've fact, kept them away from their families and lawyers for a long time. Is there anything the UN and the United States can do about those Reuters reporters? They're just trying to report on the crisis. The, there's a lot that we have to do, and we have already brought attention about the reporters. They know that not just us, the world is watching, but Burma is broken. It is absolutely broken, and we can't look at the fact that the United States dealt with it a few years ago and think that we have to coddle it. Military sanctions, sanctions on the military again? I think that we need to look at everything. I think we absolutely need to look at everything, and I don't think that we should in any way be soft on what is happening in Burma with the government or with the military. I think they need to be held accountable for what they've done, and I think we need to make sure that we provide a safe place for the refugees because repatriation is not something that is going to come easily because they're too scared to go back and they have a right to still be scared. So Indeed, a lot do. has to be done when one, it comes to that. One last question, you've been an ambassador now for about a year. Um, your thoughts on being uh, the UN ambassador? I mean, it's such a privilege. It really is. I feel honored, I'm humbled. It's the idea of serving your country is already overwhelming, but the idea of serving your country to move the ball and try and um, see that we can make the world a safer place has been really rewarding. Frustrating, because I mean, when I look at Myanmar, I mean, I want to do something yesterday, and I imagine that it, you know it, it's hard for uh, ambassadors to look at some of these crises and not want them to 
handle yesterday? I think that's been the hardest part, is seeing the number of people suffering around the world and wanting to fix it and not being able to fix it fast enough, I think has definitely been the hardest part. Ambassador, thank you. Hope you'll come back. Okay, thanks so thank much. You.